you know, this whole thing started for me again when I was younger. It's not just like you hear a voice in your head like where there's a question about it. Like you feel it through your entire body. And this is something we can call like a telepathic lock on. So I heard he can see us. And, you know, as I heard that, I saw this almost what you can call a shadow entity, but it was almost scintillating, like it had a mild glow to it and and it collapsed into an orb. So I get in my car and within a few hundred feet of me driving, right in the sky, sent right dead center in the sky, there's just a fireball there. And in my mind, I think, holy shit, that's a UFO. As soon as I think that, it starts to move. The, the crash occurs and all of a sudden I'm face to face with this like uh, a light being right for for whatever reason the first impression that I got when I saw this this entity was that it was not separate from myself I saw the past the present and the future kind of as like one thing and then right after that it flipped into me being above the scene of the accident and I'm like I'm thinking so this is it huh like I think I'm thinking that I'm dead and I was just, to I was totally cool with it. Like I felt totally at peace. Just like there wasn't like a regret or a care like, oh no, it was just like totally fine. It was like t the most blissed out thing, equanimity. Um, I, I just felt perfectly at peace. There's a whole other system of government and bureaucracy that is 100%. going on and has been going on for over a hundred years on this subject that has compartmentalized itself in such a way as to keep it from scrutiny from those people that believe we're living in an open, transparent democracy. When when they learn about this and they learn this is true and when this is publicly acknowledged officially, is not that other entities exist and they're interacting with us. Yeah, that's kind of like, wow, that's amazing. But they have to come to terms that they've been lied to, right? Their government lied to them intentionally to keep this away from them. So what else? Somebody's fucking watching us. We're being watched by a higher intelligence. I and mean, what the hell are they thinking we're doing? Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I am here with James Iandoli. And I watched him on a podcast the other day, and he's got a really interesting UFO story and kind of an, uh, an I'm going to say alien uh, uh, interaction story, but I could be wrong on on a, the specifics of that, so I'm sure he'll correct me. So check out the video. I really uh, appreciate it. You know, this whole thing started for me again when I was younger. And, uh, you know, these experiences, I, I don't want to say like necessar necessarily that they were alien, right? I don't know exactly what they were, um, but my early experiences happened when I was just a kid and like literally in my room. And, uh, you know, the, the whole way it started was, um, what is kind of like jarring, right? Because the first, um, instant I noticed anything was I, I heard, um, a voice like, and it's not just like you hear a voice in your head, like where there's a question about it, like you feel it through your entire body. And this is something we can call like a telepathic lock on. So I heard, um, he can see us. And, you know, as I heard that, I saw this. Um, like almost what you can call uh, a shadow entity, but it was, um, it was almost scintillating. Like it had a mild glow to it and, and it collapsed into an orb. Uh, and I was absolutely frightened, you know, cause I'm maybe five or six years old when this is happening. And I literally just, um, you know, put the covers over myself and I'm trying to hide that happened maybe a dozen times when I was younger. Um, so because of, and, and, and other than that, I had, uh, spontaneous, what people call out of body experiences. And, you know, back, back then I didn't associate the two together. They just seemed to be different experiences in, in retrospect. Now, looking back after I've been involved in the research for so many years, uh, you know, there, there actually seems to be a connection to all that, like all these experiences. So um, can I ask a question real quick? So yeah. when you're five or six years old like was there any any interaction or contact other than them just saying he can hear he can see us i heard i heard it was it's it's really hard to explain um i heard like it almost sounds like gibberish but you could it it 
it interprets through your body somehow. I, that's the only way I can say it. You um, you mentioned the movie, um, the knowing, yeah, the knowing, which was a great movie. Who whoever I I don't think that whoever made that movie just like made that they either did really really intricate research or they had an experience themselves because that the way they that whisper thing happens is, was exactly like I got chills when I saw that movie. Um, and that's the same kind of thing, right? Like we, we hear UFO and we think aliens. Um, but in, and even in that movie, the way it was represented, you know, they had a kind of religious underpinning to it where there were kind of like angelic entities, but in, in some regards, that's actually closer to the truth. Um, not to say that there aren't, uh, what people call extraterrestrial biological entities, meaning like, oh, these kind of, um, like gray figures and the, the typical beings that you see with the big heads and the big eyes, um, like that, I, I think, you know, I had not ever seen that directly, uh, but based on all the testimony and the reports out there, I, I do think that is something that's genuine. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to go too far off onto a tangent, but some people speculate that that's like. Uh, an advanced organic AI basically. Um, and those, those entities are like, um, you know, created or generated to, to f fulfill like missions or w whatever you want to call it. So, um, but an entity like that, I had not ever seen. Um, these entities look more like, again, um, you know, shadow beings or light beings, whatever people want to call them. And again, orb phenomenon is something that's really apparent um that's only being reported on more frequently now it's it's been reported on it's been discussed but um it, it's really a intricate part of the ufo phenomenon but again going going back back then i didn't necessarily uh associate that with the ufo phenomenon because i i would have experiences like that and then again spontaneous out-of-body experiences where i'm just like laying down and, and about to go to bed and it feels like I'm sleeping or, and, and all of a sudden, like I, I, I'm looking down at myself and I'm like floating out. And, and as soon as you, you realize like, holy shit, that's, that's me. That's my, my, myself, my body, whatever you snap right back in and you, and kind of wake up. Uh, that's how that happened for me at least. But it wasn't until, uh, you know, many years later, I guess, um, when I was 20 years old in 2007, when I had a series of um, UFO encounters that really, uh, you know, you know, pushed me into this kind of like no going back um, because, you know, the early experiences led me to do, uh, you know, inquiry and research. So even from a young age, I was reading books on UFOs and, and metaphysics. And, you know, at 18, I started doing meditation kind of, um, partially because of martial arts, but more so, um, you know, cause I was like looking in the, in the bookstore and I found books on meditation and stuff like that too. So I'd been meditating for two years by 2007 and, um, the, the 2007 wave of events for me that really, you know, thrust me into this world for keeps and, you know, kind of made it a mission for me to be involved. If I can say it that way, um, it's, it started off really weird. Uh, and in a, a series of events that we would call like synchronicities and high strangeness. And the reason that this is important is because Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was the official astronomer for the, the U.S. Air Force for Project Blue Book, um, found that the, the most genuine UFO close encounters that occurred had something what he called high strangeness. And it was, you know, high strangeness is basically a a a type of phenomenon or, or a series of events that are just so you know so extreme or outlandish that there's there's no other way to categorize it other than high strangeness but this association with high strangeness and close encounters was so strong that he he made this term to to you know denote that this is something that happened in a lot of close encounters and uh, you know along with dr jalen Hynek was uh, you know jacques belay um who's an important researcher so, you know, th these events I would consider high strangeness and it started, uh, the, 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 you know, there's kind of three events that really marked this for me that pushed me into this. And the, the first one, you know, I'm, I'm working an overnight shift 
And, you know, one of my coworkers in the morning before I left the shift, who's super kind of conservative guy, you know, we talk about like family and, and, you know, work coworker kind of talk. Right. And out of nowhere, he said to me, Hey, did you hear about the UFOs in Mexico? And, you know, I, I found it really weird that he would even bring the subject up, you know, uh, cause I, at that point I, you know, I had the earlier experiences, but I had an interest. So for him to say that, I'm kind of thinking like, what, you know, where is this coming from? Uh, but I, I brushed it off. I figured it's just a coincidence, right? So I go home, I drive home and I go to sleep and I worked an overnight shift. So this, you know, by the time I go to sleep, it's like maybe eight 30 in the morning or so. And in my dream, when I go to sleep, I have this insane, uh, kind of like a, you, you can call it a UFO dream, right? Um, and in the dream, I'm, I'm driving, uh, down in my old neighborhood and there's just this, um, like a orange plasma UFO right over my car. And it's a dream, but I'm, I'm like freaking out, you know, um, like it's pulsing with electricity and stuff. And I can hear like the energetic charge and I can feel the sensations in my body. And it's, and I'm, I'm freaking out in the dream. I'm just like not thinking. I'm just like, I need to get the hell away from this thing. Um, and, and I'm trying to drive away. Is and this, this is like going a, on for a suburb. I mean, is this some, yes, where yes, a suburb, suburb, like anybody yeah. could walk out of their house and see this thing. Like, it's not like, well, it's yeah, but this is, remember, this is a dream. This is, this right now uh, is a, is a dream. But, oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Cause I know that at some I, point you get in your car. Well, yeah, that's, this is, this is what Sorry. follows. This is the crazy, this is what's so crazy about it. Right. Is that, you know, so uh, and I'll, I'll round that out for you. So it, it's a dream and I'm, I'm like driving, I'm trying to get away and I snap out of the dream. And by the time I wake up, it's maybe like three 30 in the afternoon and it's either late spring or early summer. And somebody, you know, one of my family members walks on my house and the first thing they say to me is, Hey, did you hear about the UFOs in Mexico? So I'm like, you know, and this is the high strangeness thing, right? Right. So I'm like, screw that, you know, screw this. And you know, the reason I say high strangeness, because there's, there's no, I mean, there's no way in hell that you're going to have th that series of events take place as a coincidence. Right. Um, you know, and I've spoken to different researchers about it and, you know, I don't know whether that dream was something that the UFO phenomenon basically placed into me, right? Like, did they make me have the dream or was it some kind of precognitive event? Uh, and I don't know the, yeah, I don't know, you know? Right. And, and so when, I, because when I, you know, the family member said that to me and I'm like, okay, screw this. I need to just go. And there's a Chinese place down the street for me that I used to always go to. So I'm like, I'm going to go get some Chinese food and just like relax, you know, cause this is kind of bullshit right now. Um, so I get in my car and it's again, it's three 30 in the afternoon. Maybe it's broad daylight and I start driving and within a few hundred feet of me driving, I, you know, I'm looking, you know, ahead of me. Right. And right in the sky sent right dead center in the sky. There's just a fireball there. And in my mind, I think, holy shit, that's a UFO. Uh, and as soon as I think that, cause it was, it was stationary. As soon as I think that it starts to move <laughs> and I like, I'm freaking out at this point. Right. And it's, it's like the, the, the fireball in the sky is like, amazing right but the what what really did it for me the whole what really hit me so hard was that the series of events that led to it because the whole thing is like this whole ongoing event at this point it wasn't just i'm driving and i see this fireball i had somebody who oddly out of character said something to me about a ufo in the morning um, ufos in mexico i had this crazy dream and then as soon as I wake up, this family member says something to me, the same thing that this guy said, this UFOs in Mexico. And then, and, and then I have this daytime sighting of a fireball. So the whole thing is what really hit me like a ton of bricks. Uh, I think the, almost the whole series of events that, that led to it occurring was, was almost more insane than having the daytime sighting itself. You know, it's like, how do you weigh that out? 
Um, so I, I was, you know, I tried to chase the fireball, you know, it was moving, it was kind of just moving across the sky, gliding across silently. Um, and I, you know, it, it eventually got out of my sight. I wasn't able to, to keep up with it. Um, it didn't like zoom off or doing anything fantastic, but again, it's just a, a fireball, maybe the size of a dime or a little smaller floating through the sky. I mean, it, it looked, you know, at arm's length, it looked that big. Um, I don't know how, how far away it was necessarily, maybe a few thousand feet, uh, but it was still incredible. And, you know, after that event, I was really, um, you know, it was an, it was an impactful event. So I, at that point I was even more kind of, you know, driven and excited to, to look into UFOs as a more, you know, um, as a, as a really kind of serious thing, because at this point, um, I guess you can say I'm, I'm being interacted with, right. I didn't ask for this to happen. Uh, the earlier ones either. Um, and again, like I said, the earlier ones, even at this point, I recall those experiences, but I'm not necessarily tying it to UFOs at that, at that point. So, you know, skip ahead, maybe two to three months, you know, I don't know the exact time frame, but it was it was about two to three months. I ended up having this um, this crazy, you know, I it's not an NDE because I didn't I didn't nearly die, uh, but it's something I call um, you know a trauma induced out of body experience. So I got into this um, this car accident, and uh, during you know. When the accident happened, all of a sudden that, you know, I'm driving and the next thing I know, the accident happens and I'm, I'm like face to face, you know, in, uh, with this, like a light being right. Like an entity of light. And how how uh, did the, how did the accident happen? And like, when, what, when was it and how did it happen? Cause these are, so I was listening to your interview when I was actually uh, painting. So I, that's why I think I, I feel like I, I must've walked out of the room or something. Um, that's why I felt like I, I thought you had come home from work, gone to sleep, couldn't sleep, went to leave or, or went to drive around to go to sleep. And that's when you had the accident, but I guess I, I missed something. But so what I'm wondering now is when you had the accident, was it in the middle of the night? Were you in a middle no, of this- subdivision? This, this was actually in the daytime. This is because my work schedule is insane. I'm working overnights. And I think at that point I'm working like seven days a week. Okay. And so I fell asleep when I was driving basically. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. And, it, and, uh, this was in daylight. This was, but it was similar. Yeah. I, I was, it was in the morning, kind of like not quite, at, not quite noon. Um, but I fell asleep when I was driving and, you know, I didn't realize until afterwards that my car ended up going upside down and, and basically into a building. Is this, um, is this, and this is in the middle of a, uh, like a populated area. It's like a suburb. Yeah. Okay. So the, and the crazy thing is that this happened and I didn't realize this really, I didn't really think about this until years later, but this happened exactly like to the T exactly where I saw the fireball, um, sighting craft, whatever okay. you want to call it. Um, and again, I, for whatever reason, I didn't put two to two together but literally to the T, the exact same location. So, you know, again, when the crash occurs, I guess I have, maybe you can say I have a lapse in consciousness, right? I don't know, but the, the crash occurs and all of a sudden I'm face to face with this, like a, a light being right. Um, and for, for whatever reason, the first impression that I got when I saw this, this entity was that it was not separate from myself. Um, and and again, that's an impression. That's the feeling I had of like a knowing of that. And, uh, I heard this entire, like crystalline orchestra. It's like, you know, it, you know, I guess like if you imagine being in heaven or something and hearing that like kind of angelic music, that's, that's what it felt like. Right. And, um, and I'm not, mind you, I'm not like religious in, in a sense, like I, you can say I'm spiritual cause I'm doing meditation and I'm into those kind of subjects, metaphysics or whatever. Um, but not religious. And I, I heard, you know, a voice say, uh, 
you know, God is all there is, ever was, and ever will be. And, um, you know, I, for whatever, whatever that means. And all of a sudden it, fl- I, you know, it flipped into, I guess, like a different, uh, thing, right. Where I saw, you know, I, I can try to describe this as much as I want and never comes out exactly how I perceive it, I guess, is that I saw the past, the present, and the future kind of as like one thing. And then right after that, it flipped into me being above the scene of the accident and I'm looking down at the accident and I can see my car. I see an ambulance. I see the building. I see the street. I see the whole thing. And what's crazy is that the, the, my point of view of where I'm looking down was exactly where the fireball was when I had seen it. And again, that's not something I didn't, I didn't, I didn't put two and two together. Like that's not something that automatically hit me. I didn't realize that for, for years after until I was telling, um, a researcher, uh, doctor, one of the stories years later. Um, so that, that event like was, was extremely profound for me because, you know, even though it wasn't like a true near death experience, I, I felt like I had, you know, escaped the claws of death. Basically I was like, wow, like I, I could have died if I did, you know, if I somehow had hit my head the wrong way or whatever. So I, after that occurred, uh, you know, I was just like so grateful even just to be alive at that point and, you know, add on to it, the, the, the experience, right. Um, that I had was, um, you know, I guess transformative in a way, because Did when you, you, when you have snap back into your, like a lot, you know, you're, you're looking down on yourself. Did you suddenly you're back yes, in the, yeah, in the vehicle? Sorry, yeah, or, okay. yeah. Yeah. So I, when I wake up, I'm in like the ambulance basically. And I'm like, Holy shit, I'm alive. But even when I was looking down at the accident, one of the craziest thing was like, I was conscious, right? Like in my awareness, I might not have been in my body, but I was aware. And it's not like I wasn't being like pulled through the experience where like, I wasn't conscious of what's going on because I'm looking down at the accident and I'm like, I'm thinking, so this is it, huh? Like I think I I'm thinking that I'm dead and I was just to, I was totally cool with it. Like I felt totally at peace, just like there wasn't like a regret or a care, like, Oh no, it was just like totally fine. It was like the, t- the most blissed out thing, equanimity. Um, I, I just felt perfectly at peace. Right. And that, and then I, I snapped into my body and I'm like, Oh my God, like, Holy shit, I'm alive. And I'm in the ambulance. Um, so, you know, the next day, uh, you know, cause I wanted to do MRIs and scans and whatever, make sure I didn't have like internal bleeding and all that. So the next day I get home and I'm just like super grateful to be alive. Right. And I'm still like, I, I feel different physically, right? Like, and I, I hate to use words like this because it's going to rub people the wrong way, but like energetically, right? I literally feel different, like a different frequency in my body, if you can say that, right? Um, but I'm just super grateful to be alive and I'm like just cleaning my room, whatever. And this ends up being the next day at night and how this whole chain of events occurs. And as I'm just in my room or whatever, I hear like, I hear, I don't even, it's not even just like I hear a voice, just like when I was a kid, I hear a voice, but I can feel it through my entire body. Uh, and it says, come outside. But the, the crazy thing about that is, is people call it a download, right? Or again, we can say it's a telepathic lock on. Because as, as soon as I hear the voice, it's not just I, that I hear or I feel the voice. I got like this whole uh, like a package of like information, if you want to call it that. And But what I what I mean by that is there's like all these sensations. I get like this kundalini experience through my body um, and and I see these two entities again this is in my mind that i see it like right e- my eyes are open and i can even see everything around me like normal but there's like an overlay um of these two entities 
and you know, I hate to say this because it's it's in the UFO literature, and I, it sounds hokey or whatever. But I saw, you know, I saw, uh, you know, a male and a female in these kind of like almost grayish blue spacesuits. You know, blonde hair, blue eyes, what people call Nordics or tall whites or whatever. I I saw them and um, and I heard that, but I also got these kind of, I guess you can say, messages that they're related to us and they want people to know that they're here and all this. You know, and and I have to, you know, kind of preface this by saying I don't know if I don't know if that's true. Right. Um, If 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 they're related to us and they're here to help us or I don't know if my mind made that up to try to cope with whatever was going on. I don't know if they actually literally communicated that. And I don't know if they actually actually literally communicated that. And that means it's true. Right. It could still be a deception of some kind or, you know. In, in my own sense, it felt as genuine as ever. And, and while this is going on, I'm not even questioning it. I, I'm taking it literally. Um, so, again, it said come outside, right? And as soon as I heard that, I just instantly, like, the, I, there's no second thinking. I just ran outside. And I get out. I get out the door and I get there's some, like tree coverage over there over when you walk out the door. So I get past that and I look up and I you know, even before I'm looking up, I hear this, this hum of this, uh, you know, what I end up seeing is like a, a craft that's almost like a hexagon. And it's like, vroom, vroom, vroom. And I can feel the pulsing um, when it's, when it's making that noise. And I have this, again, this almost like a Kundalini experience of energy and electricity throughout my entire body. And, it felt like my awareness was connected to their awareness, if I can say that. And like, I was feeling that their state, the state of being that they're in, I could feel. Uh, and it was the super elating. Uh, like I felt, you know, super blissful, I guess, if you, if I can say that. And again, it's it, this, this craft is must be like a hundred feet in the air and it's shaped like a, like a hexagon, almost like a, like a dark metal, if I can say that it wasn't, it wasn't black, like black matte blackout, but it was like a very, very dark gray and almost seamless. And there were like, there was a perfectly square white light fixture in the center. And around it, there were just lights going around like this, like, um, you know, yellow, blue, purple, red, green, the whole thing. And I'm kind of, it's above me kind of just gliding across and I'm, trying to i'm going down into my driveway i get down into my driveway and i'm watching it for a few seconds and then instantaneously you know while i'm looking at it 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 you know you can say dematerializes it disappears and it reappears about a thousand feet away or 1500 feet away over this this man-made lake that's there and it it just reappears there and it's just you know slowly moving and it's got the lights moving around it and once my once I'm looking at it over there, my focus is over there. I can see that there are two other um, crafts just like that, and you know about the same distance away, and they're all kind of moving around slowly in the sky. And at, at this point, I'm I'm really thinking like, am I am I hallucinating at this point? Like, did I hit my head so hard in that accent that I'm just imagining this because this is uh, over the top. This is over the top now, and I'm kind of freaking out. So I ran into my house and, you know, two of my family members there <laughs> and I said, guys, um, they're here. Or, or I said, you got to come outside. And, there's, and they say, why? I say, they're here. And they said, who's here? I said, just come outside. So my two family members come outside and they, they see these crafts just moving around with the, you know, the lights spinning around and everything. And this is going on, you know, they're just like, you know, in their jaws drop basically they're they're witnessing the same thing and they don't know what to make of it and uh you know so after maybe like 20 minutes or so of, of watching this and and while i'm watching this like i'm thinking in my head that the whole world knows that this is going on i'm like because this is it's a suburb area right so right. i'm thinking that everybody is seeing this like there's no question in my mind and i'm thinking like the, the whole world's gonna know about um you know you know ufos and 
at that point, what I was thinking were extraterrestrials. But, and, you know, in retrospect now, after a lot of research and thinking, I don't, I don't necessarily think that it's as, as simple and straightforward as that. But I'm thinking that the next day that this is going to be like the whole world's going to know that, you know, these beings are here and, and everything. Um, but, uh, you know, the whole way that this, this event ended was by, you know, I, you know, I hadn't paid attention to where the third one was, but there's the, there's two of them, two of these crafts left and the lights are spinning and everything. And they're, they're going towards each other like this. And as soon as I'm thinking like, oh, they're going to, they're going to freaking crash, right? They're going to, as soon as they made contact like this, they just both vanished and the sky was empty and quiet. And I was, you know, and that was, that was the end of it. Right. And I'm just, uh, I was amazed because I'm, I'm still trying to take the whole thing in, you know, when it ended, when it ended, I'm, I'm like, holy shit. Like what, what just happened? You know, why did this happen? And, and, you know, that's what led me on the journey of creating, engaging the phenomenon, uh, you know, which is my YouTube and podcast. I mean, I, I made it, this happened, this all happened in 2007, but you know, it, 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 years later of research and, and being actively involved in the UFO research community and speaking to different researchers um, is what led me to create engaging the phenomenon. Um, but <clears throat> I got the impression from this contact, these, con these, you know, series of contact experiences that, you know, people, you know, the, 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 the entities themselves, again, they communicated whether, whether it was literally or as a deception or whether my mind some somehow tried to create a reason for it to happen or something is that I, I, I got the impression that, you know, that the intelligence wanted people to know that they were here. And, and again, you know, they said they were related to us. I don't know if that's true. Um, but I, I, you know, wanted people, people to know that this was all real. Cause now I had these experiences and I know for a fact that, uh, this is something that's genuine. So I felt compelled to get involved in the research community publicly at that point and to share information. Um, but I also realized that I can like, I can't just tell somebody about this experience, right? Like I, I can tell somebody, but it's, it's not going to have the impact you know, you're not, it's not, you're not going to have that switch go off in your head unless you have this kind of experience, right? Like even if, even if, um, you're convinced UFOs are real, you know, having a direct experience like that is going to, is going to just, it's going to change you, right? It's going to, it's going to transform your worldview, the way you see yourself, the way you look at the universe, because all, you know, all of a sudden within a few moments, you now have to reconsider everything that you thought you knew was true. And you're like, holy shit, if this, if this is true, you know, what, what else did I get? What else is true that, that I'm not quite sure about. Right. Um, so it has that kind of like paradigm shift and it opens your awareness up to so many other possibilities at that point. Well, isn't this is also like the first time that was the first time that you actually, you know, you, you know, it's not in your head, like your, your family members came out and saw it. So it's like, okay, so this isn't just me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually have someone that. So you guys are seeing this. Yes. Okay. Yeah, good. Physical. Well, then I know it's not me. Yeah, it's a phys physical crafts, like right. You know, um, and like I, I mean, the fireball convinced me, right? But this again, this was just on another level, um, for several different reasons. Again, because I had the telepathic lock on thing, but again, I had witnesses, my family come out and see this, and it wasn't just like with the fireball it was like a minute kind of looking at it and it's out of the, my way. This is going on 20 minutes and I'm, you know, and we're a physical craft with the hum and everything. Um, so at that point I started really active, like very seriously dedicating myself almost like a life mission to research and, and, and trying to share information. And um, it was at that point that I found CE five or close encounters of the fifth kind um, which, you know, for people to understand, you know, there's a close encounter scale, um, you know, close encounters 
of the first, second, and third kind, which were created by Dr. J. Allen Hynek as a way to uh, categorize and classify um, close encounters um, when he was part of Project Blue Book. So, uh, you know, close encounter of the first kind is seeing a craft, you know, within 500 feet, it says, but, but really a close encounter of the first kind is like you see a craft close enough to determine it's an actual UFO, basically. Right. Uh, a close encounter of the second kind is that a, a UFO leaves some kind of trace, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, uh, like a, a radiation trace, it's tracked on radar, it's, it's recorded on video or picture somehow, you know, there's some kind of trace that you can attribute to the UFO. Um, and then the closer encounter of the third kind is if you have like a, if you see an entity, right? If you see an occupant of a UFO, like in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, uh, that was uh, done by Steven Spielberg, that, you know, that's a close encounter of the third kind. A close encounter of the fourth kind, which which Dr. Jalen Hynek did not create, somebody added to the scale, is when somebody has an onboard experience or an abduction experience. And then uh, Dr. Stephen Greer created the term for close encounter of the fifth kind, and there are different levels to it, but, uh, you know, more commonly it's known as a human initiated contact where you intentionally go out to do a, uh, you know, to have an encounter, you invite the encounter to happen and, and one occurs. Um, and there's, there's two, uh, there's two degrees of that I say, because if somebody is just watching a UF, you know, they're, they're out, whatever, and they're looking at the sky or, or whatever it is, and they see a UFO and it's just moving along. They just randomly see a UFO and they think to it like, or like, oh my God, I wish it would come closer. And all of a sudden the UFO stops and starts to come closer. It seems that there's some kind of telepathic connection or, or mental connection, whatever. Um, that's, that's a CE five of the second degree. Um, you know, according to Dr. Stephen Greer's category. But a close encounter of the of the fifth kind, first degree, is when you go out and you do what's called the CE five protocols, or you know you go out and you intentionally invite a UFO encounter, and one appears. That's a close encounter of the fifth kind, first degree. That's that's when people say CE five. That's more, most generally what they're talking about. And Dr. Stephen Greer created protocols to to have that kind of encounter. Um, but I, I want to preface that a little by saying, you know, I found Dr. Stephen Greer because I'm crazy doing research at this point. Like all, you know, my, all my free time I'm doing, I'm doing like research and meditation basically. Um, and I see this press conference on YouTube and it's this random doctor, right? Uh, and a bunch of military witnesses talking you know, in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Club about their firsthand encounter while serving in the government with UFOs or UFO related information or the UFO cover up. So I bet there's about 12 witnesses and they're all sharing their testimony, highly credible people with credentials that could be vetted, um, you know, sharing their their testimony in Washington, D.C. about their firsthand knowledge of UFOs and UFO cover up. And, you know, what was weird to me is just like the whole thing was hosted by this, this is kind of random doctor. There's all this military people and I'm thinking, who the hell is this doctor, right? Why is, why do you have a random doctor hosting this event with all these military people? Like, why is it not like a colonel or general or something like right. that? So I'm like, who is this guy? And I start looking into all his work and that's when I found CE5 because he, I, I found a video where he's talking about contact. And what struck me when I'm watching his video is that the way he's describing contact and how it occurs was exactly how I had experienced it. And there are, there are just like small, subtle details that he's explaining that you, you couldn't just make up, right? The only way you could know some of those intricate details were if you experienced it from yourself, you know? So that's what struck me of that. What he's talking about is authentic. So I'm like, okay. I, I started researching all his work. I read his books and, uh, and I'm, you know, he has guided guided practices for what he calls the CE five protocols. And, um, you know, 
just just to clarify too there are other groups who did similar things and in earlier years but um this is what i came across first and so i started doing the the ce5 protocols and i i got responses right it was working it, it wasn't like the experiences that i had when it was just kind of like they spontaneously happened to me it wasn't on that level of um you know, impact, I guess you want to say, or wasn't as crazy or dramatic, but sure enough, you, if you go out, you do the protocols, which, um, you know, to do a quick overview of the, this, what's known as the C5, CE5 protocols is you basically do some kind of meditation where you're going to get in a calm and tranquil state. And then you used what you use, what's called remote viewing, you know, which, you know, if anybody's interested in remote viewing, look up the, the CIA's program, project Stargate, and, and how the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense and the U.S. military both studied and utilized remote viewing, which is basically being able to use your consciousness to see a distant time or, or, or space, right? And, and the government was using this to gain intelligence, and they got some pretty serious hits when they did it, like meaning they were able to acquire certain information that could have not otherwise been known. And that project went on for 22 years. Um, but anyways, so you're, you're doing meditation and, and you do what people, you know, you can call remote viewing. If you don't believe you can remote view, you can do like an, uh, a kind of visualization of, um, you know, seeing, uh, some kind of UFO or, or an ET craft as, as Dr. Greer would say, um, in deep space or around the earth or where, wherever, and you're using kind of like a visual, a visualization or a remote viewing vector to draw them back to your location, like in, in a, in a seamless sequence. And that's what he calls coherent thought sequencing, which is, is part of the C5 protocol. And, you know, sure enough, if you practice anything um, enough, you're going to get good at it. And it becomes more automatic. You don't have to sit there and intentionally, you know, it becomes less mechanical. Um, so when you, you get pretty good at the process eventually over time and, you know, again, you do it enough times, you're, it's like, you know, throwing a rock at a target a thousand times, eventually you're going to hit the bullseye. So I was doing, I was doing this on, uh, you know, a, a very regular basis, probably more than I should have because I was so impacted by the other encounters. And I was also thinking, like, why didn't I think of that, right? Like, it's so, like, if I was having these encounters and having this kind of direct um, mental or telepathic connection, like, why wouldn't I think to do that, right? So, um, sure enough, I got pretty good at it, and I, I was able to have regular responses, right, which could vary in all different types of ways. Um, some could be more dramatic or some can just see, you see a light in the sky that will stop and then move in another direction and, and, you know, or fl flashes of lights or, you know, a, a more kind of extreme, but elusive cases. If you have like an orb come down into your yard or where the location you're at. Mm -hmm. And for people who want to see like a small example of this, there was just a history channel episode of uh, beyond skinwalker where they go over the Chris Bledsoe case. And that's a case that has been investigated by NASA and the CIA and the DOD. And they were highly interested in his case. And um, he had it's so because of that, it's been documented fairly well where you have somebody from CIA on property or somebody from the army intelligence on property. And even they're baffled by some of the anomalies that are going on. Right. And, you know, so the, so the people understand, you know, uh, UFO encounters or, you know, encounters with now what they call it UAP, unidentified anomalous phenomena. It's not always like the movies. So you can ha be having different um, anomalous phenomena occur. And it's, it's not like what you see in a movie, right? It's going to be stranger than that uh, and more bizarre and, and harder to define, right? That's what makes it anomalous. And, you know, a lot of people in the older UFO research field have a hard time coming to grips with that because they want us to be seen as, as credible and scientific. So if you're not talking about a metal ship in the sky, they kind of get a little 
hesitant to discuss it, even if they know that's the core of the, the work and the research and what's being reported. And, and you know, n- nowadays it's more accepted in the research community because it's been investigated by the Department of Defense in, in, in a program that was called OSAP, um, and, uh, and which later became ATIP, which is what came out in the 2017 uh, New York Times story. And it, and it came out that, you know, Robert Bigelow was contracted and created this government program with the DI, uh, DOD and the DIA with all these really, really top level scientists like Colm Kelleher, Dr. Eric Davis, Dr. Hal Putoff. And, you know, Dr. Hal Putoff was involved with that Project Stargate remote viewing program and uh, Dr. Kit Green and, and Jacques Vallée and all these other really highly regarded scientists. The, the remote, I remember seeing something on the remote viewing back in the late 80s, early 90s when during the Cold War, probably in the height of the Cold War where they were having people that were that supposedly could do remote viewing and they were trying to have them place themselves in Soviet military facilities, yeah. right? Like it started at military. Absolutely. Or military applications and, you know, where they wanted them to, can you go into this building? Can you... And they would come back and say that they'd looked in, you know, this room or that room or tried to go into a file cabinet, but couldn't do it. Or well, was, uh, it was interesting because there was what was interesting was they would be able to describe buildings. Yeah. And wow. the insides, the outside, where they were, when there was no way these people would know where these buildings right. were. Right. Or and what you know, they looked like or anything. And there's an incident with, you know, a classified Soviet submarine where it sh- there's no way it should have been there and and you know these guys were able to track that and it was accurate intelligence and and when they're given the remote viewing of the coordinates they're not telling him what to look for right and the coordinates are not a longitude latitude it's just a number that represents a target and so they didn't even the the, the viewer that that got the hit didn't even know what the intelligence community was looking for and sure enough he got this insane insanely accurate hit which was actionable intelligence they could now take this intelligence and act on it strategically right, right? they didn't have the program for 20 years because it didn't work right, right. or they it may not have results. been per- right you know it may not have been perfect but if they could use it operationally that's why the program continued and i'm going to argue uh, that it, it still continued to this day, and it's just been stovepiped and hidden away and compartmentalized and moved, basically. Right. I was um, gonna say, well, listen, if the if the Department of you know if the Department of Defense can consistently lose hundreds of billions of dollars, then they can be running other programs without anybody knowing, you know, off the books that nobody's in charge of. So. Right. Well, and that's how that's how the UFO programs have been kept, what's called unacknowledged special access programs or, or waived special access programs or controlled access programs. And, uh, you know, the, the the you know, the big issue with the secrecy is how is the secrecy been kept? And it's it's because people in charge haven't been in the loop. Right. Congress and the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Senate. They haven't been kept up to date on this. They're they're blocked out of the programs, and that's why now now we're seeing the public reaction from all this. Yeah, I was, you know the other thing I was thinking about when you were talking was the the descriptions, like you're saying that when people are describing these events, and you know they're you know whatever uh, Operation you know Blue Book or you know whatever whatever the people that are going out kind of collecting this information to do these investigations are kind of blowing off anybody that doesn't specifically state it was a craft. It was clearly a craft, but the problem is, is that, you know, they're looking at a, like you said, a very tangible, you know, this must be a craft. This must be like a ship. This must be, but the truth is because that's what, that's just how they're conceptualizing. This is the only thing it could be. But the, the problem is, if you could communicate with an ape what's happening and ask an ape how to describe what's happening in the zoo or in the jungle or with humans, or they would never be able to describe it. They would describe it in a very rudimentary way to the best of their abilities. Because the truth is they don't really understand what that vehicle is. They don't know what a bus is, what a plane is. They don't know where this food is coming from. They don't know what these things are. They would have to describe it in the limited, you know, 
cap- with their limited capabilities. So they're, you're, they're going to get a very, very rudimentary explanation of what's happening. So for us to sit here and try and conceptualize what we're seeing, like, you know, we have a limited vocabulary, a limited understanding, and we're seeing things. And, you know, just like you said, like, you don't really know what you're seeing. You don't really, right, just like right. what, I, what I like is that you're like, you know, I'm not even saying that I necessarily even know you know, are these really people that are beings from another dimension that are telling the truth? Are they really aliens? Are they really like, I don't know. Here's what happened. Here's what I saw. Who knows? Did, did you ever see that movie? Um, uh, they. They. I'm oh, not listen, sure. I'm going to send you the listen. It, it's Is it's it a, they or they live? Is it They Live? Yeah. Well, I think no, there's the older one, They Live with Roddy Piper. Yes. 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 Oh, yeah. A yeah. B movie. I love but it. I, yeah. What, what I loved was that it was everywhere. They were yeah. all around us. Yes. You just didn't know. You know, they're, they're supposed to be making a follow up uh, Netflix series or something to that. Oh, man. What? Wow. John great Carpenter. Would that yeah. Be? I hope so. I hope so. You know, that was, that was a great. That was a great because when he puts on those glasses and you realize like, oh, wow, we're we're just like we're like clueless Disney yeah. World. Yeah. And we have for, for these beings. Well, living our lives. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up for uh, several accounts is number one is like, yeah, like we, we see a UFO and we think we think we're so smart and we know what it is. Right. And like, just as an example, right? So crash retrievals are a big subject now. David Grush, uh, who is a highly credible former intelligence officer, has come forward. Um, you know, he put an official intelligence community inspector general complaint about how this issue is being mishandled and, and illegally hidden um, from Congress and oversight about crash retrievals. Um, and that happened in the, the UFO or UAP hearing that happened a few weeks ago in Congress by the Oversight Committee. But just, let's just say all that's true, right? Let's say that we, you know, Roswell is real and, and there's a few other incidents that occurred that are that are real. And we have these craft and we even have bodies. That doesn't mean we know where they're from. That right. does not mean we know where they're from or even what they are. Right. right, or you could even conceptualize where they're from, or what dimension, or what planet. Right, or right. What. If something was from another dimension, how would we even know? Right. We, right. I was gonna say my argument is always, um, because I I have a friend that you know I, I don't want to say he's a he's you know an enthusiast, but the problem with him is that he believes in every conspiracy that has ever been, like I mean well, from. Bigfoot to the Loch Ness monster to JFK to I mean, you name a conspiracy, he believes them all. So, but one of the things I always argue with him about is, you know, is that you know, why would they be here? Yeah. Like, what do we have that they don't need? There's nothing like if you could travel billions of light years or be an interdimensional species. There's nothing we offer. Well, yeah, and so there's 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 really great uh, thinking on that, right? Like number one is who says they're not from here, right? Right. Because it, as far and Jacques Vallée wrote a book called Passport to Magonia, and um, and there's been good uh, there's a book called The Crypto Terrestrials by Mac Tanis for people who are in, in, interested in looking at these kind of ideas. Is that you know number one, is, let's just say they're from another dimension, but they coexist in the same space, right? Like they're from Earth, they're just shifted in a slightly different frequency or dimension, and you know, and either intentionally or unintentionally, they're they're coming in and out somehow, right? Maybe their technology is just so advanced they can interface with our dimension or frequency, and maybe there's certain spots on the Earth where the that wall between dimensions is thinner, like what people argue for, like Skinwalker Ranch and Mount Shasta, and and those kind of you know Catalina Island. Um, and these other areas where there's high activity, right? Um, or, you know, there's, you know, Dr. Hal Putoff, who was, you know, you know, helping uh, with that remote viewing program, wrote, wrote a paper called the Ultra Terrest- the Ultra Terrestrials, which is hy- a hypothesis for, you know, maybe w- the origin of, of the UFO intelligence, what some of the possibilities are. 
and you know, Mac Tani's crypto terrestrials are saying, actually, you know, they, they could have been here the whole time and they're just making us think that they're from space. So we're looking out there and really the whole time, you know, they have been coexisting with us for thousands of years in some kind of hidden way, whether they're using technology to mask themselves or they're living in the oceans because there's way it's, you know, Richard Dolan's coming out with a book called the USOs. Right. But all these Navy encounters are by the water. Right. Yeah. There's way more uh, surface or coverage underneath the ocean than there is. We know less about, about the ocean than space. You know? Right. Right. And I... so if they have, if they are so advanced in technology and they're able to somehow hide in the water or maybe they maybe they're a civilization that came here thousands of years ago that just have an outpost did you see the movie here. the abyss i did not I, I my friend keeps telling me to watch it i gotta get yeah. around to it yeah it just comes out of nowhere when when you see the whole movie and at the ending it's like wow like it like this is not, i didn't see it coming yeah you, um so it, it, it just turns out that they're you know the ocean bed is just that's where they're living. There's massive, massive cities yeah. down there that we just don't have any idea. And the only reason they even make contact is because we're kind of exploring the abyss. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, we better uh, go ahead. Okay. We better yeah. go well, ahead and see you know, what's up. And, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't read the book yet, but there's something called chains of the sea. And apparently it's kind of tied to that kind of idea. And, uh, you know, one of the people who put that forward as a, you know, a theoretical was, was Lou Elizondo, right? And that's the intelligence officer that uh, counterintelligence officer that came out and, you know, spoke to the New York times and disclosed the, the program, a tip, you know, advanced aerospace threat identification program. So it's not just like UFO researchers are speculating. There's also people that are in the intelligence community that are also proposing some of these kind of ideas. Um, you know, when you said like kind of that they're, well, I, I was thinking about Interstellar. So I guess you didn't say this. I was thinking about Interstellar. Did you see that? You saw Interstellar, right? Yeah. 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 That was great. But what was it great was. is that it was, it was like, this isn't an alien speed. This is just us. Right. You know, communicating. These are well, what fourth, fifth dimension or uh, the, us in the future living in different dimensions. Yeah. And then I was actually talking to my buddy the other day because I'd watched a program on Mars. And I'm, I'm always watching stuff. I'm always playing stuff in the background. And I just while I was listening to it, they were talking about how in the future, they said once we're, you know, an interplanetary species and humans are being born on Mars, they said we'll become a two-species race. Yeah. Where they said, because think about it, they said they won't need They'll be taller, thinner, less bone density, less muscle mass. You know, so all of these things you know, that they were saying that, you know, 2000 years in the future, Martians, humans, that Martian species will look so vastly different from us, even though they're human. Right. That they would they would essentially be aliens to us. And if right. they were, to, you know, what I'm saying and, and what happens, who knows what happens in the evolution of that species? Yeah, I right. That was super like that to me, I felt like, wow, you know, that kind of plays into the whole inter um, interstellar, the, you know, who knows? Yeah. And there's, the, and see, these are the types of like lines of thinking we need to be exploring, you know, for the past, like, you know, however many years, most UFO researchers and, and people that are just like watching UFO movies or, you know, alien movies or whatever, you know, the, we almost had like an automatic assumption in our mind that, oh, it's aliens from another planet or from another place in space. When really it could be something that we, we can't even comprehend or think of or haven't thought of yet. And, you know, what you're, you know, there's a, a guy named Dr. Dr. Michael Masters. And I th he's uh, I think he's an ev evolutionary biologist. Uh, professor and you know he has a theory called the extra tempestrials which is saying like they're basically time travelers and it's a, you know this could be us like a hundred thousand years in the future coming back and that would explain why they're somehow not the same as us but similar like right. the, uh, the chances and the odds that they would have a head two arms two legs but that is reported so, so frequently in the, in all the literature of UFOs and contact literature and experiencer literature. And, and, they, 
and they want so li- they want such limited contact with us. Like you don't want to alter the future. Right. Right. You know? And also, you know, for, you know, pe- you know, people who report that there's DNA taken and stuff, you know, things like that. Like, why would, you know, so those ideas I think are, are a good direction rather than just assuming that they're just extraterrestrials from outer space. I mean, however, I, I still think that the, what the ETI, the extraterrestrial or the ETH, the extraterrestrial hypothesis is, you know, we should still keep that on the table. And, you know, I have to say that, you know, based on different encounters that I've had, uh, you know, the ones that just happened to me and, and during CE5, because I've done the CE5 stuff, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times over thousands of hours and, and during the different kind of interactions or what have you, I don't, I don't think it's all the same intelligence that's responsible for what we call UFOs or UAP, unidentified anomalous phenomena. It seems that there's different things that are going on, you know, um, you know, people report different types of entities and, you know, even in stories of like crash retrievals and, you know, there's, there's different types of crafts that are sometimes reported, you know, sometimes there's a triangle, sometimes there's a disc, sometimes there's a cigar shaped object. Sometimes there's a, what we call a craft or vehicle, but it's made of light or plasma. You know, there's all these different um, signatures. So I don't, I don't think that we're, we're dealing with all of the same intelligence necessarily. Yeah. I've, I have no problem with believe with, uh, I'm totally okay with not knowing or, or understanding the fact that I have no idea what's really happening. You know, right. I can, I can look at my cell phone and a, and a vehicle and tell you, I don't know how it works. Right. Right. Vehicles are magic. My cell phone is, it's a, it's a little box of magic, Yes, you know? So I have no, <laughs> I have no, you know, I, I have no problem admitting that, look, I don't know what's happening here. You know, like I right. don't, it doesn't, I don't have to know. Like, I understand this is beyond my understanding. Um, yeah. And I was just, I was thinking like, you know, you know, that I, I will watch a program where they were saying, look, these things have been cited forever. And then right. even if let, let's assume that the Roswell crash was real, okay. you know, so there's a real craft that was, you know, captured and, and maybe, and, and there's a few other instances and maybe, maybe actual, um, you know, if they're aliens have been actually captured, you know, why it's always like, well, why wouldn't they tell us? Well, in the 1950s, like if you had told the civilization that there were aliens, most of civilization is being still being held together by religious beliefs. Yeah. That would have fundamentally changed. But if you slowly leak these things out and change the consciousness of you know the global consciousness, it's because it's not like it's just happening here. This is everywhere. We're yeah. slowly leaking it out. And then you get to a point where you say, okay, I think they're ready because let's face it. When those tapes came out from the, uh, from the, um, the Navy and that to me, was the first 100% concrete yeah, right. evidence. Do you know that didn't do anything to me? Right. Like I right, didn't change right. anything for me. Yeah. I listen, after I heard that, I still went to church on Sunday with, you yeah. know, with my wife, we still sat there. I still listened. I still got in my car. I, I was like, that's crazy. Did yeah. you hear about the tapes? Did yeah. you watch that thing? Like I'm talking to my buddies about it. We're like, what, what's going on? What's going on? It didn't fundamentally make me decide I'm going to stop paying my bills right. and I'm going to run around and become a, a maniac because there's no heaven. Like I didn't, that wasn't, wasn't what entered my mind. It was just like, it, I had been so inundated by it over the last 40 or you know 50 years that I was like, I kind of fucking, I kind of knew that anyway. Yeah. This is yeah. proof, but I kind of felt like it was pretty, there was probably pretty true anyway. Now I've got proof that it's true. So I'm good with it. It didn't change anything, but I think in the forties or fifties, I think it may have, may right. have really done some damage. Yeah. And, you know, they did a study back in the late fifties, early sixties called the Brookings Institute study. And they, you know, they determined that if they would have disclosed this kind of idea to the public at that time, that it would have been catastrophic. And, well, you know, what I, happened when Orson Welles did the program saying that we were being. Yeah, 1938, people, right? Yeah. Right. Like if you took War that the in a test run 
yeah. people went nuts. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, the way it was presented was kind of jarring too. It wasn't just like, hey, there's aliens or there's no, extraterrestrials. Yeah, yeah, it was, over the, it yeah. was like, we're being invaded. It was like, you know, quick, so, go, so th- go buy stuff in the grocery store to live for the next, you know, three apparently, months. Apparently, I think back then toilet paper would have been disappearing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know i so yeah i think you know there there have been people so the the cover-up back then was probably again i don't want to say justified necessarily because you know we're a democracy and you have to ultimately come to a vote or a determination right but may you know i could definitely see why back then where they were like we you know especially you got the cold war going on we just came out of world war ii like you don't want to upset things worse than they are like we're not even sure that we're on a track where we're not going to nuke ourselves right 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 mutually assured destruction and maybe they don't even really know what to say right and and maybe this is our one meal ticket to ensure that we're going to be ahead of the access uh, you know ahead of you know for, foreign adversaries like this right, is our yeah. one guarantee that we will we will have technology that can outdo our, our adversaries in in a cold war right right like you don't want to you don't want to telegraph that. So, I mean, there's strategic purposes why, especially back then, why it would have been so safely guarded, um, you know, because, you know, we had atomic weapons and we know that the Soviets had, uh, you know, atomic capabilities. And so we, you know, they, that kind of, to some extent lost our edge in that case, but, you know, this is a sure thing that we're going to have something that we can kind of, glean off technologically and and stay ahead um so do you think real sorry were you done with your thought um i was going to go somewhere else but Uh, by all means go ahead well i was going to say do you think that 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 the united states like do you think that those got that the the navy were they not the you know the navy pilots where they you know they released the video and do you think that that was done purposely like hey let's go ahead and start start slipping this stuff into the okay. record so or, by okay. by some by somebody it was done intentionally i mean there's a whole course of action that took place to make sure that those tapes came out and they came out in a way that could not be contested and that was done by you know christopher mellon lua lozando and and a few others but you, you got to understand so that you know let's just say that there's a there's a, a secrecy group right that has been covering this up right people call it majestic or majestic 12 you know whatever majority committee so if there was a group like that not everybody is on the same page there some of them are from different religious backgrounds uh, moral backgrounds some of them are more power hungry some of them are more democratic in their thinking and they they're not all on the same page right and maybe some of them for decades have been trying to leak some of this information out uh, in different ways that were safe for them to do so, even though for them it was kind of risky, but it wasn't like, you know, they're putting their lives in jeopardy necessarily, but they're still getting information out to the public little by little and giving them breadcrumbs. Um, you know, again, amidst psychological operations against the American people, there, there, there are disinformation campaigns, and there have been. And you know, David Crush testified to that as well. But you know, so maybe, maybe within that uh, that group of that's keeping the secret, you know, some of them are some of the people that have been in that group were dying off, and new people are coming in and taking on the the roles, and uh, enough of them have have wanted transparency that they've been able to make bolder moves. And now, now that the toothpaste is out right now that they have gained that momentum, they can go ahead and, and, and put out as much as they, they think is safe to do it. Right. Like they're not going to put out a plan to uh, how to create a UFO. Right. But maybe, maybe the greater portion of, of the secrecy group, they they want people to know that it's time for for a few reasons to for the people of the earth to know that we're not alone. There's another intelligence here, and that we have this technology, right? Um, so I think kind of that's that there are these different you know like factions within this group, and that you know the the group 
the the portion of it that wants transparency has has gained enough momentum now to to put out what they think is safe to put out without um, kind of putting national security at risk, right? We're, they're still able to put out the general information to some extent, uh, you know, and, and part of, you know, again, this is speculation. What some people in the intelligence community have said is that, you know, we have these crafts, right, from crash retrievals and we cannot make make sense of it right like we we can only make so much progress right like you had philip corso who wrote the book the day after roswell and you know he was a colonel and allegedly he was in charge of taking some of the technology and giving it to private industry p small pieces to different uh, companies within the industry industry you know this his his testimony goes back to the 1960s saying that they gave like one little fragment to this company another fragment to this company so and and they didn't tell him it's it's where it's from right uh they said you know this is um foreign materials just try to figure out what it does how we can recreate it or what we can do with it and back so back starting at least in the 50s and 60s we started to reverse engineer some of the technology that we can make sense of but um and that's how we got like, again, this is highly controversial, but, uh, you know, they, they, the testimony will say that's how we got, uh, you know, fiber optics, lasers and, uh, integrated circuits and like computer chips and stuff like that, you know, and, and how technology kind of boomed and blew, took off really at, at that time period. Uh, and not that we weren't working on some stuff like that already a little bit, but it augmented greatly what we were doing and, 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 and made us kind of create technology way faster than we would have. Uh, but, you know, other people argue too, that there's some parts of the technology that there's, we we're we just can't, we don't know what to do with it. We're just not, we're not break because, because the programs are so compartmentalized and so secret and they're so siloed that you can't have big teams of people working on it. And it's, it's delaying our progress, right? And allegedly, the other other countries like Russia and China and maybe Korea or whoever that have at least parts of this technology too, and maybe they have more people working on it. And and if you start making breakthroughs in this kind of technology, you're gonna you're gonna far exceed other other countries' capabilities, and that's that's a national security risk. So now you have the secrecy of UFOs creating a national security risk, right? Right. So if you publicly disclose the general idea that we're not alone, there are advanced technologies and intelligences that have been interacting with humanity, and we have some of the technology, you can create, you can begin to make pathways for programs that can more efficiently and effectively work on the technology, get more brighter people and brighter minds on it, working on it together so we can make those breakthroughs because we've hit a wall. Yeah, I can only imagine the the secrecy that would be surrounding something like this. Like you, you right? You can't you can't have a large group of people working on it at the same time. Look what happened with the Manhattan Project. I mean, the Soviets, right. which we and we know of, that yeah, they're twenty, they're thirty years behind us. <laughs> not yeah. not when they've got people inside the Manhattan you know right. project giving them information. So yeah, so I'm sure that was a that was a hard. Obviously, that was a hard lesson to learn you were 20 to 30 years ahead of your, you know, ahead of your um, competition. And five years later, they're setting off or, you know, there are two, two or three years later, they're setting off their own nukes. Yeah. So, and you know, there's, there was a scientist um, named Dr. Eric Davis and you know, he, he talked about how, you know, there's a way, you know, every, every few years they look at the technology, they have, a, they, have a program that tries to reverse engineer the technology and they, if, if they can make sense of it at the time, or if they found new sciences that can make more advances, they do what they can. And then once they hit a wall again, they put it away for another few years until scientists come up more and evolve more and become more intricate. And we can revisit that technology with the advances we made and try to make more out of it. Um, but that that was creating a problem because we're not, moving with it fast enough and we have potential adversaries that could be making advances. Um, but with that, you know, I, I want to mention, uh, 
the something that's called the Wilson Davis notes uh, because it, it's, again, it's highly, um, you know, relevant to this conversation and, and the testimony of, of David Grush, who was talking about UFO crash retrievals and UFO um, reverse engineering programs, or what I think he called, you know, exploitation programs. And because, you know, you had the scientist, Dr. Eric Davis, who's actually ended up working for that, you know, because this this uh, meeting he had with an admiral, this guy, Admiral Tom Wilson, uh, you know, it, this goes back a few years because and it goes back actually goes back to Dr. Stephen Greer, believe it or not. So l- let me go back there real quick. Is So in 1997, Dr. Stephen Greer had a meeting in the Pentagon with um, Vice Admiral Tom Wilson, who at the time was the deputy DIA director. And he brought with him the astronaut Edgar Mitchell, who was the sixth man to walk on the moon. And he brought with him a, a Navy commander who helped set the meeting up, uh, Commander Will Miller. And Dr. Greer brought some documents with him and and some information to Tom Wilson and the Pentagon to say, hey, you know, we need your help. You have these secret programs, these UFO programs, and here's a bunch of information basically on, on how to find them. So uh, and allegedly, according to the story, Dr. Greer has this NRO um, document. And, you know, again, according to Dr. Greer's testimony on the document, there's like code names, code numbers. And Tom Wilson, Admiral Vice Admiral Tom Wilson recognizes some of some of these programs because he's he's also joint joint chiefs of staff at that point so that all this stuff is supposed to be under his command basically and he's like wait you know he notices he he recognizes a few of the program names and numbers so he goes ahead and he contacts them right and he he speaks to uh somebody in the program and they say you know we know who you are um admiral tom wilson but you're not allowed to be read into these programs you don't have access he's like what are you talking about i'm i'm j2 i'm the deputy dia director i should be running these programs you don't you're not telling me that i don't have access to them i'll you know so he went through chain of command he went to the special access um um, special access program oversight committee and he went through his channels and he's a big gorilla in at this point right um and he, again, like technically, probably he should have had oversight over these programs if these programs were run the way they were supposed to. But because they're clandestine and they're uh, black programs, he was he was basically blocked out of the programs. And, um, you know, people went on to vet this meeting, like Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, um, confirmed that the meeting happened. And um, so, you know, and then. You know, we find out in two that you know in two thousand two, Dr. Eric Davis, who ended up being part of that OSAP and ATIP program, he's a scientist. Uh, you know, he worked on classified programs with the Air Force. He worked with uh, Bigelow Airspace, and uh, you know, highly intelligent guy. He ends up getting a meeting with Tom Wilson in two thousand two, and you know, to to talk about these UFO programs, and. You know, Dr. Eric Davis took notes during this meeting he had with Tom Wilson, and those notes leaked. And um, you can, if you look up the um, Wilson Davis notes, you'll see the notes, and you'll get you'll see the discussion that they had. But basically, you know what what Vice Admiral Tom Wilson discloses in that in the notes and in the meeting is that he found that the program he found like two or three programs and he was able to get a hold of um, somebody from one of the programs and they invited him to come, to come visit and speak with them. And he ends up getting in touch with a a program or a project manager, the, the program security officer and, and a corporate lawyer. So they tell him like, you know, the reason that they, they had the meeting with him is because they wanted to know how he found out about the program because they had almost been uh, uncovered and they almost were uh, compromised because of an audit several years before. Um, and it, you know, if they're found out they're in deep, you know, they're in trouble because they're, they're basically running a, a black program, which 
technically could be illegal, but it, it's also partially kind of. Those I don't want to say government audits. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, they they could lose their funding and they're, you know, they're doing something they're not that nobody's supposed to know about basically with black money. Um, so they have the meeting with him and they, and he's Tom Wilson admits like he thinks that it's being, it's UFO is being used as a cover, but it's really like, you know, Russian or some kind of other technology that we found. And the, the people in the program are like, no, 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 no. This, these were, this technology is not made by human hands. And they go on to talk about, um, you know, the same thing, right. That we have recovered off world vehicles and, we, we work on it. It's highly compartmentalized. Uh, you know, it's kind of been brought into the private sector. You can't FOIA it and it's, it's proprietary, right? If it's in a corporate setting. So you, the government kind of loses a little bit of access to it because it's proprietary corporate information. You know, they can legally say you're not allowed to know certain things about our company, right? It's, it's proprietary. So, um, they end up telling him they have an, a full intact craft, right? And this is some of the stuff that David Grush has testified to Congress about, right? So that's an, a separate source that's saying the same thing about these crash retrieval programs that some of them have intact crafts. Um, so they tell Tom Wilson, you know, you know, you're not on the bigot list, so you don't have access. We're not going to show anything with you or share anything with you, but as kind of like a courtesy. And so you'll leave us alone. We'll tell you a little bit, you know? Um, and you know, they tell them that, you know, they have the off world technology. They try to make sense of it every few years. And then again, they put it away, they shelve it and they, they revisit it and try to make the advancements. But um, they, they, there are certain parts of the technology that they just can't crack. And, you know, the significance of that, that document, right. The, the Wilson Davis memo, which came out in 2019, I believe. And, you know, some of me and my friends had it earlier than it was like really, really out there in the public. And at the time I was speaking to Eric, Dr. Eric Davis and I got a, um, I got a quote from him uh, for public use. So I, I was speaking with him and this is this is funny because the quote I got from him, this was kind of like, I think like two weeks before the notes broke out into the public in a big way. Um, but Lou Lozando, the intelligence officer that was part of the ATIP program, ends up going on Fox with Tucker Carlson. And Tucker Carlson's like, Do you do you believe that the US government has materials or debris from UFOs? And Lou Elizondo is like, uh, you know, I have to be really careful about what I say because of my security clearances. And it looks like he's going to just back away. But then he says, uh, but actually, simply put, yes. So, and Tucker Carlson's like baffled, right? This guy who is in charge of the UFO program for the, for the government just said that he believes that the U.S. government is in possession of crash retrievals, basically. And so I asked Eric Davis that night. Um, I said, what do you think of Lou's statement on Tucker Carlson? And so Dr. Davis replies, you know, I think that, uh, you know, Lou Elizondo, and this is a paraphrase, Lou Elizondo's um, statement on Tucker Carlson about uh, the U.S. being in, in possession of, uh, you know, UFOs and UFO technology. And first he said crashed UFO technology and then he changed it and said, no, use this quote, crashed and landed uh, UFO technology is 1000% accurate. And, in it, you know, then the notes break out, right, and is public and everybody kind of like realizes that Dr. Eric Davis is a lot more involved in this than people assume and that he was involved somehow, right, with getting access to crash retrieval uh, information, right. Whether, however he did that and whatever he was tasked with. Um, so, you know, at, the notes come out and it was like a huge deal because, you know, again, those notes took that meeting took place with Dr. Eric Davis and, and Tom Wilson in 2002. And now it's 17 years later, 2019, the notes go public. And, people at that time realized that Stephen Greer had the meeting with Dr. Edgar Mitchell and Will Miller and Tom Wilson in 97. So now 
people are putting everything together. And uh, you basically, it, in the gist of all that, you have Vice Admiral Tom Wilson, who was the deputy DIA director. But by the time he had the meeting with uh, Dr. Eric Davis, he had been the director of the DIA. And then when he had the meeting in 2002 with Dr. Eric Davis, he had just retired and went to the private sector. And uh, they met in Las Vegas at an eg and parking lot and all that. But so now when the notes come out, everybody puts all these different pieces together and, and you basically have Vice Admiral Tom Wilson going, you know, saying to Dr. Davis that we have recovered UFOs crashed and landed. So um, and, and now, you know, several years in the future now from 2019 into 2023, you have David Grush, who is, you know, this guy was somebody who prepared, you know, presidential briefings, not necessarily on UFOs, maybe, maybe I don't, you know, I don't know if we would ever know that, but on other intelligence, because he worked with the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, which is one of the most secret and highly classified uh, government agencies and the NGA, you know, uh, National uh, Geospatial Agency, which is dealing with uh satellite images and you know if you were going to track a ufo you know these are the two places you would do it because it's all the satellites right um and and because david grush ended up you know the reason he got involved you know and i would i would recommend everybody watch the the ufo hearing that it's on youtube if you if you type in you know 2023 ufo hearing it's going to come up or oversight yeah. Uh, yeah, congress everywhere oversight. yeah congress oversight committee you know David Grush has has testified under oath before Congress, along with two Navy pilots who were involved in, you know, one was involved with the Tic Tac incident, uh, Lieutenant Commander David Fravor involved in, the, you know, he testified to what he knows, uh, especially about the Tic Tac incident. And then you had uh, Lieutenant Ryan Graves retired, um, who was involved with a bunch of UFO or UAP incidents on the East coast in 2014, 2015 with the, the other videos that came out with the, the gimbal. And they're like, hold, um, uh, they're like, Holy shit. What is that, man? You know, they're like, you see, look at that on the ASA and there's, there's a whole fleet of them, you know? So he was involved with those incidents, but you know, David Grush, you know, part of how he came into this information about crash retrievals was that, he was assigned to the UAP task force. So after those videos were released in 2017, eventually in, I think, 2018 or 2019, we officially got the UAP task force to say, hey, wait a second, what's going on? And, and you know, not not so much of the public knows, but the re some researchers know and the people that were involved in, in these programs know, like Dr. Eric Davis, who was involved in the UAP task force, at least unofficially. Uh, and these same people, Hal Putoff and uh, Lou Elizondo, I, you know, again, to whatever capacity, either officially or unofficially, are involved with the UAP task force in, in 2018, I believe, and onwards to investigate what does the government know about um UFOs, like what, you know, what happened to these incidents that are being reported that because they, they said a tip ended right in, uh, you know, the government said, oh, you know, a tip uh, ended in 2012. Lou Elizondo says, no, it didn't, because I was the director of a tip until it ended. And when, at, you know, after he left until until he left. So and he he came out in 2017 to The New York Times. So just a month before he came to the New York times, he had, he was the director of a tip and that's 2017. So that a tip, which would never really ended morphed into UAP task force, you know, just so people have a contextual understanding of the timeline. So UAP task force was formed and you had uh, Jay Stratton who was also involved in a tip and OSAP, uh, I believe becomes the director of uh, UAP task force and uh, David Grush is assigned to the UAP task force to investigate as part of their investigation. So while David Grush is, you know, is basically given orders to investigate it by the government on an official capacity to investigate UFOs and UAPs, 
uh, while he's working with the UAP task force, he is investigating and he finds individuals, but also individuals start coming to him. And, and I mean, you need to look into David Grush's background because the level that this guy was cleared to is insane. Again, NRO and NGA are extremely highly sensitive. I think they said that, that David Grush had access to like 2000 special access programs, which is insane. You know, those most people are not going to be assigned to more than one or two or whatever it is of those programs. He had a really high clearance and oversight to special access programs. Um, and, and just for context, if you want to hear more about David Grush's background, you read uh, the debrief article that was written by Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal again on the debrief about that's how his story came out. Uh, was through that debrief article. And then subsequently he was on news nation with Ross Coltart giving like a, a, his testimony, which ends up being like a 45 minute video that was released on news nation. Just so you understand how involved and how clear that David Grush um, is or was. And here, you know, you have David Grush testifying to the same things that while he was on official duty and while he was officially tasked to investigate this, he has over, you know, again, he found some people and then he said people that he knew in the defense and intelligence um, industry uh, for years, like he knew these people and they were super highly cleared and classified uh, people were telling him and providing information like documents. And, and again, I don't know what he can publicly state, but possibly photographs and maybe videos um, again that that there's a crash retrieval program and that there's bodies that have been recovered and that there's a reverse engineering program or, you know, UFO technology exploitation program. And he had over 40 plus witnesses that work directly on these programs to this day, that they still work on these programs to this day, uh, give him information. And he, while he was investigating this, he started receiving reprisals. There were there. So there was retaliation against David Grush personally while he's assigned to do this investigation. So he had to put in an, in, in, you know, intelligence community inspector general um, complaint because he's he's investigating this at an official capacity. And now he's being targeted. Right. Well, and, like you said, there's two different, right? You know, exactly. trains of thought on how it should be handled. Exactly. I'm sure that's always been the case. Yeah, yeah, right. And and but the but the side that's been trying to be more transparent has has gained momentum just recently since 2017, right? Right. And now they have they have some force behind them. I mean, now that that Congress is. So from 2017, like Congress didn't really know about all this. When that came out, it gave insiders the excuse and the ability and the bravery to start speaking to people in the Senate Intelligence Committee in the Congress and oversight committees, the armed service committees. At 2017, they started receiving briefings from some of these people. And, you know, we find out through David Grush's testimony he was able to start providing some of this information to the two key people who, and I mean, like if you look at the Congress now, and even if like Chuck Schumer recently put out language in the national defense authorization act for 2024, and you know, he's the Senate majority leader, the most powerful man in the Senate. And he's, he put out language that is saying in the language 22 times, it says non-human intelligence. Right. Right. He's not just putting that there 22 times randomly. Right. He even if he won't publicly admit it or whatever it is, he knows something. He's putting that language that he's informed. Right. There's other and there's other people in these committees that probably have been briefed on on, on a very secure level and are convinced and they're taking action. That's why we're seeing this here. The hearing come together at all. Right. We had the hearing is unprecedented. There's never been a UFO hearing in in, in the history where you had service members testify. It's always been other people that are speaking to, to UFO evidence. This is right. firsthand testimony from people who are actively involved. And well, uh, I would say, you know, like, but you know, think about it. Like, I understand what you're saying about Congress, mm -hmm. but you know, well, Congress should know. I mean, okay. 
pe certain people in Congress should probably know. But I mean, Congress is just some guy who decided right. they're representatives, they're right? Right. You know what I'm saying? People but, are like, oh, well, Congress is in the government. Well, wait a minute. Congress, yeah. is, they're, they're just representatives. Like this is some guy who honestly a year and a half could have been running a grocery store. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, just yeah. Because, but, but, but the significance here is that you, I mean, publicly you can see that they're pissed, right? Yeah. You, you can see that you can see the actions that are being taken. Over the, the last course of years, there's been several of these NDAA, National Defense Authorization Acts, where like the one from last year, there was over 40 pages dedicated to UAP. And in the language, you can see the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Congress are trying to get answers so, because they've been kept out of the loop. So there are, are actions being taken for more transparency. You know, you have Senator uh, Gillibrand, right. who's also from New York publicly stating you know that if she came into the information that this is real she wants the public to know and i don't i don't think that this is some kind of show or or political move or whatever i think because again you do see the bipartisan support and you see actions being taken that where if they wanted to they could have just all had some secret meeting somewhere we would have never known yeah. about it and never heard about it and that would have been the end of it i don't think it's you know like you know, I don't think it's a, a show. I think that these are people that genuinely just don't know and aren't being kept in the loop because they're under kind of the whole delusion that that really that everybody's under, which is something that even you said. You're like, well, you know, we're in a we're living in a democracy. Like, we're not living. It, we're technically we're, a republic. we're, a, we're not a republic. A we're a democratic republic. Right. So right. you know, there's a whole other system of government and bureaucracy that is 100%. going on and has been going on for over a hundred years, what, 200 years, I guess, but let's say a hundred years where it's been, let's say, let's say, well, I guess less than a hundred years, maybe on this subject that has compartmentalized itself in such a way as to keep it from scrutiny from those people that believe we're living in an open, right. um, transparent democracy. Right. And, and sure. so now that they're about to be just now they're slowly being, so, discovered they're freaking out yes well and see that's the thing and 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 part of the thing about the secrecy i don't i don't think people are will, are so shocked about ufos right i think one of the hardest things that for people to realize right when when they learn about this and they learn this is true and when this is publicly acknowledged officially is not that other entities exist and they're interacting with us yeah that's kind of like wow that's amazing but they have to come to terms that they've been lied to right their government lied to them intentionally to keep this away from them. So what else? What else are they lying about? What else are they keeping secret? It it flips the table I, I upside down. Pretty much, this is this is probably the big one. So it is. It is. <laughs> I so, can't imagine. I'm sure there's lots of little things, but this is the big one. Yeah. Yes, for sure. And and so, but then at that point, you have to question your entire view of the world, your country, and everything. You have to question everything at that point. Again, like I, for me with the experience, it's, it's on a very deep and personal level. But with this being publicly disclosed and what we're seeing happen, there's a few kind of key things here. Number one, P, this whole thing is being exposed. So the secrecy, the disinformation, how the issue was handled. So, but that also gives us the the opportunity. I'm not a utopianist by any means, but this gives us an opportunity to start to get on a better path and say, you know, if we can correct this issue a little bit, right? Like there's more transparency on it. Maybe that, that can shift over into other parts of government where there's more transparency, you know, for different reasons, right? It gives us an opportunity to, to create change essentially, you know, how far that can and will go. I have no idea. I'm optimistic. I think this is a really teachable moment. I think we can learn a lot from this whole thing. Um, you know, not just, you know, cause also you have to realize like people are going to know now, like somebody's fucking watching us, you know, excuse right. my French, like people we're being watched by a higher intelligence and what the hell are they thinking we're doing? Right. There, I mean, there's going to pe be people who don't like, don't care or whatever, but they're going to be like, wow, we're being observed by a higher intelligence and they must think we're nuts. You know, like what, look at what we're doing. Um, <laughs> just look how we act, right? Like 
these are like we're hiding stuff from our own people essentially right there are are there's people with certain amounts of influence that are have misused power and 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 essentially that it affects us all though right right so this is a chance to to realize that and uh, potentially start to make change um in in better directions and the reason i'm i'm optimistic a little bit on that at, at least is because we've already seen some of those changes begin and it might just right now be mostly with the UFO stuff and the secrecy stuff and UAP transparency and how oversight has been um, undermined. But we've already seen Congress and Senate and bipartisan parties, you know, they have come together, work together on an issue, put their differences aside and actually make a change. And we've we've been seeing that happen in real time the last six years, which it's it's pretty unprecedented. So maybe that will carry over into other other you know subjects and and issues. Maybe we'll, they'll say, "Wow, look what we did when we came together and and tackled this issue and the changes we made." Maybe just maybe we can do that with other things too. Maybe right. Again, I'm optimistic by nature. I'm hopeful. I'm not naive, but but maybe maybe that will be a demonstration of like when we really need to get shit done, we can get it done. I doubt that, but I again, I'm optimistic. <laughs> I'm not naive, say. but I'm optimistic. Yeah. Maybe because again, because again, and I don't think this is like a overnight thing, right? It's, I think this is a generational. Like this is going to take decades because because now. We're gonna we're gonna come to the acknowledgement officially soon because in that Chuck Schumer language, it says we need a plan to disclose this to the public, right? Right. So you know, with plan, there's there's the kind of subtle thing of like we have to plan how we're gonna communicate this, which you know, obviously there's gonna be some kind of narrative that's unavoidable. We have to acknowledge that that the, they're not gonna paint themselves in a bad light. That you know, why would they? Um, but, you know, there, there is a plan to disclose this to the public, at least on some level, right? Right. Who knows how, what they're going to end up officially acknowledging and disclosing. I do think that the crash retrieval issue has been purposely put, been put forth front and center for a reason. I think they are going to address non-human intelligence. I think they are going to address crash retrievals and, um, you know, retrieved technologies and reverse engineering programs. I think that that will be publicly acknowledged. Um, so, you know, beyond that, I don't know. I don't know how much, I can't imagine how much further than that, because even that is tremendous. So I don't know how much further than that they'll go, but you know, with that, you're going to have a new, I mean, certainly us, we kind of have that idea, but future generations, like even the young, the people who are kids now are going to grow up knowing for a fact that we're not alone, right? That, that we are, you know, despite our differences, we are one human family, right? So there's, there's going to be generations growing up with that mentality, right? They have to, right? My, my personal, um, uh, suspicion, which could very well be wrong, is I don't I don't think that the UFO or UAP intelligence, what the, the others or whatever you want to call non-human intelligence, I don't think that uh, they're a detrimental threat to us. Right? Um, could there be if, threats involved in different if ways? Where we wouldn't be here. I, they, right, it, it, right. It would have been over. Right. Like does that does that mean here. that they don't? Ha they could still have their own self interest that inter that interferes with our society a little bit, but I I don't think they're looking to wipe us out or you know whatever it is right or take control or you know what whatever that case may be. I don't know. I don't know that's the fact, but I don't I, think I don't, that's the case. Yeah, I don't think that. L like, listen, if they wanted us gone, like it would be as simple as they would just sprinkle some. You know, they right. sprinkle some some Pathogen, dust and and yeah. and and everybody with a human DNA would be wiped off the planet. Like it Correct. wouldn't be difficult, right? So, yeah. Um, so I, no. so what I wanted to say with that is, you're gonna have future generations, the people that are kids now and even teenagers, growing up with the mentality that we are one human society, we're one human family, and maybe to some extent, like we have to stick together just in case, right? 
because maybe there's others out there that are visiting us now that are, are advanced and they're not they're they're not an overt threat to us but now that we know there are those others we may encounter others in in 20 30 100 200 300 a thousand years from now that we really need to be on the same page and not killing each other because we might have to stick together for our own survival right oh yeah it's so i mean i think so what i mean is the the social conditioning of that which might be even intentional by the ufo phenomenon socially conditioning us um is that you know I think to some extent people are going to have a mentality that like we kind of have to not kill each other and, and stick together to some extent because we have to, right. It, just to even ensure our own survival. So, I mean, that might even be part of why the threat narrative is so, you know, other than the defense issues is being put out there. So that's why I say I'm optimistic because I think that this issue of non-human intelligence uh, has the potential to to teach us and, and make us grow in a positive direction. You know, whether we take that initiative or not is up to us, right? Our individual and collective actions are going to decide that and it is up to us. Um, but, you know, I'm again, I'm optimistic. So I, I think that people have the ability to, to make the right choices and, and start going down a path that way. And eventually over time, you know, we're going to see a greater change, you know, maybe not utopian, right? I don't think it's going to be a utopian thing, but I think that we can grow in a constructive direction. Well, I don't think, I think humans by nature need a struggle. So I think, right. But I we have it. Now we have it. Be, yeah. Utopia would be hell. Eventually It'd be great it, for about, about three dissolve. months. It would, yeah, it would dissolve. And right. I don't, I don't think, yeah, we need a challenge. We need that kind of, you know, utopia yeah i think it's too idealistic yeah it's kind of like the matrix thing where he's yes we had yeah absolutely they kept failing yes. hey listen there's there's a there are science there's there was a i don't know how many times i think they've re, i think they've um done the same experiment several times where they had like mice generation after generation of mice that they were simply just feeding and keeping alive and and initially they're having children, taking care of their children um, and reproducing. But after six or seven generations, they stop having sex that much. They stop taking care of the children that they do have. They they start becoming like almost depressed. They start um, like they, there's it's a whole breakdown of the their entire society just because it's such a perfect situation for them. Yeah. Like you by nature, individuals or you know species in 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 general have to have something to strive towards well you remove and, that it's chaos you know, it's horrible it breaks down if, if, if this is not going to come off too naive um you know maybe that challenge partially or you know could instead of us like fighting for domain over the earth we'll have other places to explore and you know i always think that to some extent we're going to have yeah differences and and some level of, of conflict, but it, you know, it, you know, if we have a great challenge, like trying to discover in space and, you know, all these other like planets and stuff and potentially gather resources and we're, we're not fighting so much amongst each other just to survive, you know, there's maybe less of that. Right. And, you eh. know, but we'll again, we're, yeah, we'll be we probably won't be here to see and, it, but, um, right. Correct. Correct. Yeah, no, they're gonna they're gonna they have to drag this out. Um yeah, I I, I it, like to me, why not just come out like at this point, it's already basically out there. Might as well just come out and say, look, we've got these crafts, here's what they are. We'll give you we're gonna release X amount of information. There's some stuff we're gonna keep just for national security, but yes, at this time, this is what happened. These are the document uh, documented incidences. These are the like that to me would be. And really, I think that would practically nip it in the bud. If you said, hey, we're reverse engineering certain programs. We're not going to tell you what they are. You know, like I'd be I'm OK with that. I think I like I, the concrete. I think we're going to see that in in not a long time from now. Like, cause there, there's already more hearings planned. There's a meeting happening. It's on my later. bucket list. I just need that. I, I yeah. just need 
personally. I hear it's just you. My personal buck. I just need it to like, yeah. be like, don't. Yeah. And well, I have to so, a few people to apologize to. Yeah. So, yeah. So For I'm sure. Well, and, you know, so I think later this week, there's going to be a meeting. It's not a congressional hearing, but like Tim Br- Burchett and, and others are going to be there talking about the UAP issue in D.C. Uh, on, I believe it's the 17th. And I believe that will be publicly viewable. Uh, but in September, there's supposed to be another hearing, right, with more witnesses. Right. And, and you know, based on what I know, speaking to different researchers and, and people that are involved in the background, it this is not slowing down. This is not losing momentum. This is only going further and further. And the, the people I've spoken to that are were involved with some of these programs have said, you know, they're the push that they're doing for this is they're trying to go all the way. That's the plan. And these are people that are intelligence and military and they're very mission oriented. You know, um, they're very serious about this and they're not going to stop until until it sees the light of day. And I think. I was going to say, you know, what's interesting to me is like, I was kind of, you know, I've had those moments where it's like, well, why that, if there's so many people involved in these programs, how come at some point they don't come out? But I, I keep thinking about like, um, shoot, what was his name? Uh, Snowden, you know, like, like, you know, (laughs) like these guys sign these documents and, and the government doesn't care what, right. What comes out? Like, I don't care what, well, what you're doing is wrong. I don't care whether you, you think it's wrong or not. Some some people have come out over time, like Philip Corso, right? He came out on his deathbed, basically. Right, because um, but if you're if you're 45 years old and you got two kids, and right? You're thinking you're thinking I know all this and I can prove it. I've actually got information. I got this. You know, people. Some people will say, "Why don't you come out, bro?" Because I got two kids and a wife, bro. Like so, I'll, I'll go to prison. You think they won't throw me in prison? So, and here's the thing we we've seen some people like that, like Lou Elizondo left his career at the Pentagon where he's at the top of his game. You know, you look up Lou Elizondo's credentials. This dude is, I don't know if I could walk away from that job and he's got kids. Right. Right. Um, and he, he walked away from that job to, to help push this forward. Now he probably has retains his security clearances and can, and can work, in the, uh, you know, in, um, you know, uh, defense industry. Right. But that's still a risk. There might be people that don't want to hire him because of right. that too. So, um, so he, he faced a, a, a lot of, um, you know, pushback for what he did, but, he, but he's also not walking away with actual documents. He's not walking away with really secure documents. Is he, I mean, he helped get the tapes out. I'm not, I'm not going to say to what he got to who, right. I can't right. say that. Well, you he's know, doing it in such a way that he's got plausible, you know, kind of deniability, right? Like I look a hundred percent. Yeah. When from me, you know, you can at least, yes. it's not like you're walking out saying, look, here's yeah. this. He, here's he did this. it in the way that it had to be done because if he just came out with the information, it's not going to correct the issue. People are going to say, oh, that's true. Or other people are going to say, oh, this bullshit. And we're still in the same spot we have, we've been in for the last 70 years. What Lou Elizondo did, Christopher Mellon, David Grush, and all these people that have been pushing for this, they've done it through official channels that has resulted in creating the change we're seeing because they did it the right way. The Disclosure Project was a great initiative. I don't think we would be here without it. But the way it was done, it was almost brushed off, right? Because it, it, it got the awareness out there but nobody was brave enough to make the changes. It didn't go through the proper channels. It was just like, you know, to hell with it. You know, we are, we're just putting this out there. And again, it, it ultimately led us here. Cause I don't think we would be here now if those events didn't occur with, with Stephen Greer and then that, cause you know, the disclosure project was in 2001, right? But Stephen Greer and uh, Lawrence Rockefeller and, you know, Bill Clinton tried to get involved and got pushed out and other people tried. This was going on in the early 90s. So it took from early 90s with Project Starlight with Stephen Greer and Lawrence Rockefeller and, and Bigelow was involved back then. And all of these people were involved until 2001 when the Disclosure Project happened just to get that meet that event in Washington, D.C. to occur. And from 2001 to 2017, for more people on the inside realizing that this is true and working together and Harry Reid creating the OSAP program in 2007, 2008 and getting a program on the record, which was later publicly disclosed by Lou Elizondo 
and acknowledged by everybody else who was involved. Um, you know, which there are a lot of people, a lot of people made this happen from the inside. And, you know, again, there's been distrust over that because there's, oh, you can't trust these people, but you know, who else are you going to get the information other than the people that are involved? Right. Right. So, and there, so there's, a, there's a lot of distrust in, in, in some of the, the research community uh, because they're paranoid and they should be, but that's the result of a 80, 90 year cover up, basically, you know, um, right. it has this, it's created a cognitive dissonance and, and it's, you know, the cover up has, has been, has done a lot of damage. Right. Um, but now, you know, you have another individual who came forward who I've mentioned a, a bunch of times now is David Grush. Right. So David Grush came out, but he did so like in an, uh, through an official channel, he went to the intelligence community inspector general and put an official complaint. <clears throat> Not only that he, he witnessed these things, these programs being mismanaged, but also that he faced retaliation personally and was in fear of his life because of this. And the, in, the intelligence community inspector general, um, as reported by the, that debrief article on David Grush, deemed his, his uh, testimony and the evidence that he provided to the intelligence community inspector general he deemed it urgent and credible. Okay. So, and, and, and David Grush has given over 11 and a half hours privately on all, all the information he knows to uh, these people, right. In the, the intelligence community inspector general, and maybe people within Congress that, that he 11 and a half hours of testimony, but also provided all the evidence to support his claims. And there were people that have worked directly on the program. Other whistleblowers that David Grush vetted have also testified in a classified setting, you know, privately to these you know, intelligence community inspector general and, and maybe in different committees. There's several of those 40 plus witnesses have also, um, supported and cooperated and verified what David Grush reported initially. So there's, there's a ton of, of other witnesses that are out there that have worked or do work directly on these, these UFO crash retrieval and reverse engineering programs that have spoken to, to the people that can actually do something about it. And that's why we're seeing this groundswell. And that's why we're seeing everything happen now. Because, I, you know, these people that are making these uh, the language and these decisions now, basically, they're in the loop now. And and there's no there's no going back, basically. Right. You're not putting this one back because somebody, you know, at any given time. If, if things don't go a court, if things don't go the nice way, some of these people are going to put the information out anyways. Right. There's yeah, I was gonna say, you don't really want to come out officially and say, listen, it's just not the case, uh, you know, you, and, and take a hard stand at this point, because then suddenly, suddenly people get frustrated and they come out and they go ahead and they say, I'll bite the bullet and I'm going to release some stuff. Right. And, and now and, you're the guy that was standing in front of the podium lying. Yeah. Well, and, and the thing is like now there's, there's enough momentum and there's enough support that when that information comes out now, it won't be disregarded. People will investigate it actively. And when, when they investigate it, they're going to find they're going to, they've been provided the information. And, you know, I'm convinced that several of these people have already had their, some of their evidence and testimony stashed somewhere nice. So if things don't go the right way, there are people in key places that are going to release the information anyways, and it's going to come out to the public one way or another. So it's in the best interest of, Congress and the Senate and even people within these programs that are trying to stonewall this, it's within their best interest to go along with what's going on because they're only going to get hurt if they don't because David Grush provided locations, personnel, code names and code numbers, everything of where these programs are, how to find them, how they're funded. And even in some of the recent NDAA language, People have been given uh, anonymity to come forward within a certain time period. 
And if they don't come forward and they're found after that, the six month period or 60 day period, whatever it is, they're, they could be charged criminally under prosecution for not coming forward when they were asked to specifically. So it's within their best interest to comply basically. And they're, again, they're being, they're being given amnesty to some degree. So they, even if they're part of a program like this or they have knowledge of it, they're not going to be penalized by the government. They're not going to be persecuted for being involved. You know, they can come forward safely with the information, testimony, and the evidence that they have on this, just specifically pertaining to the UFO or UAP subject, and provide it to the proper people that they need to, the proper committees, um, and they will they will not receive uh, retaliation or you know they won't get in trouble for it. Well, if you're one of the people that don't want this to come out, you were in charge of one of those. You got they've got to, uh, those agencies or or commi- uh, uh, programs, and they've got to be freaking out right now. Hell you yeah, know, hell mean, yeah. Love to be in the, one of those meetings. <laughs> yeah, like, everybody's like, there's there's been speculation in the research community about that too, and I don't I don't want to contribute to to rumors, but yeah, that's that's certainly the case, and. I, I think there's enough people that are within those programs that are on board that they're, they've, they're complying. And they're, you know, the reason that David Grush was able to come out was because the prior year in the NDA language, the National Defense Authorization Act language and the Gillibrand Amendment, they called for whistleblower protection. So that's how David Grush was able to come out as a whistleblower. He's the first official UFO whistleblower in history. And so his case is highly important. And the fact that he was able to testify under oath in front of Congress is super important. And I think it's really important that people get behind him and support him because the people that are willing to come behind him and follow up and be whistleblowers are watching how David Grush is being treated. So I think we really need to support him so other people will be encouraged to come behind him and share their testimony and be uh, whistleblowers to this subject as well. Right. Well, listen, I, and you, 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 do you talk about this on your channel, all this, uh, the different things that are happening or what is your channel, your YouTube channel specifically going over? Do you go into I talk about everything? I talk everything. about everything. So I, I, I talk about um, contact and CE5 and experiencer stuff, but I also talk about this issue and uh, you know, again, I'll, I'll go into some history stuff sometimes. Um, I'll, but current events for sure. The last, uh, the last interview I did with my friend, Ryan Robbins, who, uh, does, has post disclosure world, um, who you should have him on as a guest sometime. He's a great, uh, he's a researcher, but he makes great videos. If you look him up, um, uh, I think you'll, you'll be entertained by his videos, but also informed. Um, so I, I cover all this on my channel, engaging the phenomenon because it's important. You know, I think, right. And the thing is, it's everything is so fast nowadays. Like years ago in the research community, if there was like one shitty news article, we were like, yes, victory. It's it's like a full time job now. It's it's hard to keep up with everything that's going on. That's how fast it's moving now. We're so interconnected at this point. Yeah. Well, Um, and there's just so much happening. There's so many like congressional, you know, witnesses coming forward, new information coming forward, new more reporting on it. Um, you know, cause you have other mainstream reporters, right? Um, my, I believe his name is Michael Schellenberger. I hope I'm not messing up his name, um, who has been publicly reporting, you know, he's an investigative journalist. Um, I think he wrote an article for the time and he's spoken to some of these witnesses, some of these whistleblowers, and he can't share their identity, but he's saying he's vetted all their, um, you know, their credentials, they are who they say they are. They have the security clearances that they claim to have. And they're telling him like, we have these crafts, we have the reverse engineering programs and uh, you know, bodies and everything. And um, so there's other investigative journalists like him. And he, he even said this on uh, the, the skeptics show, uh, Michael Schumer. I mean, uh, Michael, um, I'm, I'm blanking on his name now. Uh, the guy who's uh, the skeptic guy. Um, I don't know who that is. All right. Yeah. I I every, 
every everybody will know who I'm talking about. He's he's like the official skeptic. Um, but he, you know, uh, Michael Shermer, Michael Shermer. So Michael Shermer runs like a skeptical podcast, and he had uh, th- this gentleman on, and they were talking about these issues. And uh, again, he's written an article about it. So, and again, Leslie Kane is another journalist and Ralph Blumenthal that, you know, people need to keep track of their work and what they're saying. Ross Coltart has done a lot of work on this. Um, he did the original video interview with uh, David Grush on News Nation. Um, you know, I'm not crazy about mainstream news sources, but News Nation has taken this topic on full on. And when it comes to this, they've been doing excellent reporting, uh, fearless, basically. They're, rep- they're not holding any punches. So if you go on like News Nation's YouTube channel and you're looking at their, all their UFO content, they're, they're not pulling punches. So if you, know, you want to stay up to speed, it's, def- you know, it's a good idea to check some of those out either uh, as well. Okay. Well, listen, I, I, I appreciate you coming on and, you know, going over your story and, and just, you know, talking about talking on the subject, you're clearly way more knowledgeable than I am. Um, uh, yeah. Well, you know, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. <laughs> you know, you have an, you have the open mind enough to, and, and the eyes to see that, it, you know, what's going on right in front of everybody's eyes basically now at this point. Well, I think I, don't, I can't imagine anybody at this point would, would not realize that there's something obviously major that's happening there's still some people that are like holding and it's uh, believe it or not it's like the hardcore scientific community like neil degrassi tyson and mick west and others who who they some they yeah, think that yeah. listen 25 years ago they would mock people that would look for other planets right right exactly like, really there's hundreds of thousands of them now millions what happened yeah. to the, be, being a what happened to being ridiculous looking for other planets now yeah, now there's now there's there's millions of Goldilocks planets. There's millions of Earth-like planets. Right, they exactly. Use. They're they're in that perfect zone where there's so, there, there's a super good chance of life. And that's just our that's just our galaxy, right? right. There's hundreds of billions of other galaxies, right? right? I, I tend to because I'm I you know with time you tend to be wrong so often. I tend to not dig in. On anything, yeah, it's, you know? I, 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 it's, it's. There's so much. There's just yeah. so much information in our world today. You can't keep track of everything, you yeah. know. Like, it's, it's just crazy. Even with the UFO subject now, it's like almost too much, right? And and any other subject subsequently, like, again, this the, the astro astrology and all this. It's just like it's overwhelming. So you got to pick. <laughs> you got to use your time, uh, you know, skillfully. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching the video. Do me a favor. If you liked it, um, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell. So you get notified of videos just like this. Leave me a comment in the comment section. Um, I'm going to leave uh, James's link to his channel in the description uh, box. So click on a link, subscribe to his channel. If you're interested in the subject, share this video to your friends and family. Really appreciate you guys watching. See ya.